on cyber attacks on critical infrastructure getting increasingly frequent and sophisticated with the rapid advancement of technology. Recent studies showing that cyber attacks on systems have increased 75 percent in the past five years into 2024. Of that works out at about 13 attacks every second. But getting a coordinated response is posing another challenge to the industry. And that's what experts at the Global Cyber Security Forum in Riyadh are looking to discuss. And joining us on the sidelines of this event is Chris Inglis. He's strategic advisor of Paladin Capital. He also served as U.S. National Cyber Director and former Deputy Director at the National Security Agency. Well, thanks for joining us, Mr. Inglis. If I could point to Thank you for your time me. as U.S. National Cyber Director. In fact, this was a post created, created for you. You were a first-time director in 2021. And I can quote you on this. You said it was timely. It stitched together everything in terms of threats, uh, of frameworks, concerns at that point. I might say that I was um, available concurrently with the uh, opening of that position, but thank you for your generosity and thinking the other way. Um, I agree with your premise, which is it's timely for us to bring together all the assets necessary to ensure that critical infrastructure meets our expectations. That is less about technology than it is about a social contract between and amongst all the persons, and they cover many nationalities, um, who actually enjoy the benefits of critical infrastructure. I believe the social contract you have mentioned, uh, you've specifically stressed the need to relook that contract between public and private sector. Oh, it's a truism. Public and private need to work together. But you have had a very fresh and uh, your own take on how public should work together with private sector on cyber defense. Yeah, it's a multi-stakeholder domain to be sure, but, but it's sometimes useful to think about it in terms of the public sector and the private sector, neither of which is monolithic. But each of them has a unique set of authorities, capacities, and propensity to act. And they can be, must be complementary. We can't conceive of one or the other of those doing everything that's necessary to ensure that our citizens enjoy the full benefits of the digital infrastructure. Nor can we conceive of a moment when they act independently of one another. They must complement one another. What we're calling for is a collaboration, not merely a division of effort. And you're not seeing that complementary effort, are you? I don't see it to the extent that we can do it, and I believe to the extent that we must do it. Um, and why is that? Because it's very difficult to develop a professional intimacy uh, between two sectors that are given legal charters as different as the private and public sector in any country of interest. But cyberspace um, runs roughly across the boundaries that would separate us. And we need to lower the boundaries, the, um, the disincentives to collaborate so that we actually, again, bring the full benefits of digital infrastructure to our citizens. I am less interested at the moment in transgressors, those who would hold us at risk, than I am about forming a coalition that makes whatever it is that would hold us at risk defeat all of us, not just one of us. So looking at security, not just in terms of transgression, when you design strategies for national cyber defense, how would you define successful cyber defense? Ah, well, the success, I think, is easier said than done, which is, does any person who would make use of digital infrastructure have confidence that it will work under the conditions that they're likely to use it? When you flick the light switch, do the lights come on? When you kind of want to check your bank account balance, can you have confidence that it will be there and it will be what it should be at the moment? Those tests are relatively simple. Delivering that is a completely different proposition. So rather than chase down after transgression, the idea is to disincentivize this happening in the first instance. Final question. Yeah, well, I'd like to change, I think, speaking broadly, um, kind of for all of us, but I'd like to change the decision calculus of transgressors in this space. Make it such that they just decide that it's too hard a target, that, that the, the steepness of the curve they'd have to climb is just too great. That will actually, if we make investments in our digital infrastructure, remove some number of players from the field of play. 
but there'll be some that still try and we won't be perfect in creating defensible architectures, let alone secure architectures. So we must then kind of understand how these architectures are being used. That's best done as a collaboration. I might see a piece of something. Singapore might see a piece of something. New York might see a third piece of something. And only the three of us or many of us can put that together and make something of it. And then we need to chase those threats down, engage them and evict them at the earliest possible moment. But you can't do just one of those things. We're not going to shoot our way out of the present situation. We can't simply monitor these networks and expect that we can tamp down the fire. We need to build them so that they're inherently resilient and safe. Make modest investments in that so that they then might be defended and then actually defend them. That's the three-part play. So I might add that I think what the Ukrainians have shown us over the last three years is that not, that's not simply possible. It's eminently doable. They made modest investments in the technical architecture. They have world-class expertise, and they've deployed a coalition of co-defenders, not co-combatants, to defend against the transgressions of the Russians, and they still stand tall. Thanks, that Chris Inglis, the strategic advisor of Paladin Capital, is also serving decades in U.S. national security.